Hello there. Welcome to May I Have a Word. My name is Dasha Kelly Hamilton, and I am going to be in conversation today with two incredible human beings who happen to be in incredibly talented authors. And we're going to talk about all of that life that happens in between being a human who writes and a writer who humans. So this is an opportunity to, yes, get a, the, we'll hear from their new titles. We'll have a chance to get an idea of their writing life. But we're going to get a chance to talk about the people who write these words as well. So tonight we're going to have a chance to talk with Jen Rubin and Angela Trudell Vasquez. So our first guest is going to be Jen Rubin. I want to share some words that have already been said about her title, We Are Staying. And this is me doing fancy stuff. Not very fancy at all. Jen Rubin is a former... New Yorker living in Madison, Wisconsin, an obsessive maker of mixtapes and quite possibly the best child breaker in town. She leads a storytelling workshops around Madison, co-produces The Moth in Madison, and co-hosts Inside Stories, a podcast. She teaches the occasional social policy class at the University of Wisconsin School of Social Work, and she is also at the Wisconsin Historical Society Press. And for her title, Jen Rubin is a skilled storyteller who weaves a poignant story of the epic struggles and victories of her family's neighborhood business, the Radio Clinic on Manhattan's Upper West Side. The story gripped this uh, writer, Gregory Renz, from the very start and starting with the New York blackout of 1977. Her father nearly lost everything, and this is a beautifully written, personal, emotional point of view, and it, it, the pacing kept him turning the page at every turn. And there are a lot of other things. I was trying to edit together all of the wonderful reviews, but I want to bring Jen to the screen and have her tell us a little about, about herself. Hi, Jen. Hey, Dasha. Thanks for having me in your virtual home. I know, yes. Um, I like to speak with artists and writers in this more intimate, this is a studio yeah. B uh, in his bedroom. Yeah. So only the writers are able to, to spend their time here. So how are you doing in these odd and crazy days? Um. I mean, I think probably as well as anyone who's fortunate enough to be able to stay home, you know, so I have that relief that I, I'm able to stay home and so is my family. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, other than that, not very good, you know. <laughs> I, I, worry, That's I, worry, awesome. I worry about, uh, you know, I, well, I worry about the world, um, you know, and I also worry like my parents are in their 80s, like when am I going to see them again, you know. Uh, all that kind of thing. And, and I am trying very hard not to spend as much time on Twitter as I do. It's not healthy. But uh, so far, I haven't kicked the habit. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It kind of makes you feel like you're outside in the world when you're not outside in the world. Yeah. Um, you mentioned having your family home. So you have some, uh, I like to call them neo-grown. Yep. Yep. So yeah, I have a 20-year-old and a 22-year-old. And uh, and so they're they're back here with us now. So that's an unexpected treat, actually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where were they? Were they so? This is this is a return home, right? They're not normally with you. So my daughter, who's twenty, she goes to college in Worcester, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. um, and she's was having a great time. Um, and you know, came came back here. And my son actually um, had has been living with us since August because he's mm -hmm. trying to do like an online college. So he's saving some money and he's home with us. But I think he was used to having other outlets, you know, outside the house <laughs> besides uh, just, you know, just us. But right. My daughter, similarly. So she's uh, was able to tune into a virtual town hall. She's going to college in southern Illinois, um, which is has a main campus in Missouri. OK, it will be next fall. But we were curious if fall was actually going to happen. So we right. have kind of mapped out all of their their emergency plans and disinfectant schedules and how they're going to redo schedules. Uh, they're removing the lounge furniture from the common areas to minimize lounging in common areas. Right. So they have right. a lot of different pieces. So she, so I was giving her the update on what the campus is planning and she was like, yes. I said, I would have made a great roommate. I don't know what you're, yeah, I, I get it, but I get it, but I get it. So, but on this end though, what is it like having these almost grown people who used to need you to make their bed? I mean, uh, it's it's nice to have them. I mean, obviously, there's like you know frustrations because it's you know four humans in the house and whatnot. But it's it's just a nice treat to have them around in a way that I didn't think we would be. You know, we sort of revert back into lots of our. You know, we're playing very aggressive, competitive card games. You know, and, and uh, you know, 
<laughs> Did you say aggressive and competitive card games? Yeah. This Uno, what are you talking about? No, no, no. So <laughs> it's called it's called Pounce. And it's it's like it's like speed solitaire. So you play solitaire against each other really fast and it's it's very frenetic. And uh and so whoever wins the round controls the music for the next round. So it's very high stakes and we uh, we all take it very seriously. So <laughs> so you uh so you passed on this love and this encyclopedic love of music to your kids it sounds like. Yeah, all those I mean they, we all have our own tapes so that, you know so and so we have Sonos so we all have Sonos program in our phone so the second someone wins they like quickly kick the person's song out of the queue and put their own song in so it's very you know. Oh. So it's fun. I love this as an idea. I need something else that's high stakes. I need something yeah. else that's high stakes. I really love something that's high stakes that actually isn't, you know. So that's like that's my favorite. So yeah, so ours is um, uh, last over the spring break, Kima and our, and our younger ones who are middle school-ish, we're giving them the strategy on Monopoly. And it's like, no, okay. here's how you do a side deal. <laughs> here's how you make sure that you the bank is solid. So that's uh, an interesting, and he's talked about how at first learning the game, they were questioning all of the strategy. And then day two, you know, the claws came out, they're right. talking smack over breakfast. So I, I think we're, we're raising them right. It's happening, it's happening. Yeah. You yeah. also, you talked about reading. So being a writer, typically we are also huge readers as well, but you almost said you were almost reading to the point where it's unhealthy. Tell me how that can be, uh, be possible. Well, I guess what I mean is I, what's been surprising to me, and I don't know if you're having this experience, I have not been able to get myself to read a book. I just feel mm -hmm. like pandemic brain or something. I can't focus. And so scrolling on Twitter is easier, which mm -hmm. I don't think is good. So I've actually been listening to a lot of podcasts. I've been taking really long walks and just trying to lose myself into stories that way, or actually just trying to learn stuff. So that's, so I've been, I'm really quite a reader. So I'm just, I'm surprised. I have a stack by my bed and I'm just not touching it. So pandemic brain. So what's, uh, you get distracted or what's, yeah. what's, the, what's happening when you open the pages? Um, I think, I mean, I'll read a chapter and then I'll just be like, uh, I don't know, like I don't have the attention for it. Um, so okay. So I don't yeah, know. I have a win. So you're used to opening a book and what plowing through a whole book in an afternoon. Is that what's, or just read for like read for half an hour, an hour. Uh, I don't know. I just I, my attention span it just isn't what it usually is. Um, so I'm I'm working on it, but not that hard. Do <laughs> 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 you do audiobooks? Um, yeah, I do. But I mean, I've been do, I've been I've really just been more doing these podcasts, you know, because each one's an hour, and I could do two if I want to or or, or not. So I've been doing more of that. And actually I don't have, I don't, I should do audiobooks. I know my, my dad gave me his password into audible. So I probably should, I should do it. Yeah. I really like them. I, and interesting, I find that I'll listen to audiobooks that I won't necessarily read. Like I'm not a huge uh, fantasy warriors, wizards and all that kind of good stuff. Um, I, I was watching Lord of the Rings like this. Yeah. I was fascinated that that happened in uh, Tolkien's brain, <clears throat> but yeah. I find that I like I, I like listening to mysteries, um, the detective novels. Um, I just finished this incredible um, series by Tomi Adeyemi. Um, the first was Children of Virtue and Vengeance. So it's gods and magic and and wars of of clans, and it was great. Um, well, I'll check that out because I'm actually driving my daughter in a couple weeks back to Massachusetts, so uh, I'll need something for the ride. So. Yeah, I will definitely give it a give it a shot. So I, when I first got turned on to audiobooks, it was all of the mysteries, and I, I don't listen to those as much anymore because I binged out so hard. I'm just nervous driving in the dark. You just you just can't listen to murder for nine yeah. hours. It's just yeah. not good. I drove to Kansas City and back, and by the time I got my driveway, it was just I was not in a good space. Not right. in a good space. But speaking of listening to things and not being in good space, tell me about this podcast that's upending history. Oh, yeah. So have you heard of it? It's called Seen on Radio. No. Um, so a couple of people told me about it. And this season is called The Land That Never Has Been Yet. You know, it's taken from that Langston Hughes poem. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I haven't listened to the other seasons. This is season four. And so it really, like... I feel like was trying to have us kind of upend how we understand the beginning of our country, you know, and that the idea that like 
um, our constitution. I feel like it was things that I knew, but I never really put it together in the same way, the way they talk about it, which is that our constitution was designed to constrain democracy and not expand democracy. Um, what do you say? Imagine that. Yeah, I know. But I, but it was just like they went back to the colonial settlers and just said um, the priority was to keep the country profitable. Um, and so that and that there was that was in conflict. You couldn't be amassing wealth and be a true democracy. Right. And so so anyhow, so they really just dive deep into it. It's really interesting how they how they do it. You know, and right from the beginning, you know, then you get the you know the expansion of the cotton, you know, trade and slavery and right from the beginning. But if you you know, but if they started doing this before the pandemic, but then they, then they, but now it's the pandemic. And so, you know, the same parallels are here right now, right? It's the reason why we're going to force the meatpacking plants to be open. It's the reason why, you know, we're going to end the safer at home order because, um, you know, we, you know, because capital is more important than democracy, you know? So, so anyway, it has just been kind of interesting just to get really like into the weeds from the beginning, you know, and build from the beginning. So I've been enjoying that. Yeah, and the idea of uh, and the language of upending history when it really is uh, understanding what hi what history was in the first place. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then who do you get to be angry with? I mean, it goes back so far of how we've all been given uh, very polished and convenient. Um, how else do you control the folk but give them the story that you need and want them to have and hide the ones that you don't want them to have? Right. So, but to know that it's always been in the huh, always been baked in the bread. How right. do you how do you see what we're walking through now? Yeah. So, so I, I, yeah, so I've, I've enjoyed that. And I feel like I find it helpful just to, I don't know, just go back to history and, and read that stuff as opposed to dwelling too much on the, you know, shit show that we're having right now. So. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So tell me a bit about, um, it was still in the, in COVID. So it was going to lead into the, your book, oh, but yeah. we're also <laughs> conveniently holding up small businesses and enterprise and the fact we need to open door, open these uh, COVID walls so board of directors and shareholders can get their money. Right. Um, and how the small businesses and entrepreneurs are definitely being gobbled in this. I mean, Ruth Christie gets a gazillion dollars and all of the small businesses that didn't get this kind of support. But even before all of this, there was this conversation about what is happening to small businesses. Um, so do you, are people co-opting that conversation in the name of COVID or do you see some things that are of genuine concern um, that you carry with you from before COVID? Does that make sense? Cause I know this wasn't, this isn't a new conversation for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I'm a big fan of small businesses and I think, you know, New York, I think is harder hit than other places, but it's, definitely not unique to New York. It's here in Madison and, you know, Milwaukee that um, small businesses just are going under, you know, they can't compete against big, big businesses and chains and now, you know, online retailers and all that. And so they weren't necessarily in the best shape as a industry, you know, going into COVID. And the thing that I think is just, in addition to being depressing, uh, that's just interesting is looking at the CARES Act, you know, which is sort of the, the big federal response of, you know, money and it's mm -hmm. you know, huge amounts of money for small businesses. I feel like it does what all large scale policies do, right? Like I think there's a problem to solve. And so a large scale policy solves there to solve the problem. So there's the problem of that small businesses are in danger, but all of our policies, you know, have such weakness in them. And so like the two things that I think are always baked into the DNA of our policies is how are which people gonna get richer? You know, and so that that happened with CARES, like whether it's intentional or there's just big loopholes, right? So, so why, you know, why were these huge corporations getting the money meant for small businesses? So that's so that so that's one problem that we've had historically and we're having now. And the other problem is how does sort of the racism and inequity built into our system play out, right? So in this way, like with the CARES Act, you you had to be a business with a good relationship with the bank. Well, maybe you have, but maybe you didn't, you know, right. and, and um, you had to actually have a payroll. Well, you don't, so lots of businesses can't have a payroll. They work on contracts or they work on freelance. Right. And so that speaks back to like the racial inequity that is not a level playing field for small businesses. Right. So, so that's all. So those were problems before COVID, um, but they are woven through the response to COVID for small businesses. 
Tell us a little bit about your, so it's a lifelong understanding and, and heart space for the small businesses. So yeah. what was that like for you? Yeah, so I mean, I my family owned a small business for eighty years in New York City, and uh, the thing about New York City, I don't know if you if you had ever been in New York in the seventies, uh, but it was a lively place. Like it was, it was a fun place. And the Upper West Side, you know, you, you sort of can't throw enough money at the Upper West Side now. But in the in, when I was a kid, like everyone lived in the Upper West Side. I mean, just in terms of like economic difference, racial difference mental health difference, you know, like everyone was there. And so uh, I just found it super fun. You know, like I got paid to play video games to um, draw people's attention to the store, you know, or like I got to, you. yeah, I was paid a dollar an hour to play a video game. Um, How old ish were you? Uh, I was nine and 10. It was when the Atari arcade video games first came out and people didn't know what it was. So my dad put one in the window just to see if people wanted it. And the thing about that neighborhood is probably like 50,000 people walk by the store on any given day because it's right by the, the biggest subway. Okay. So, uh, you know, so um, I just had, you know, I just had fun. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I don't know that my dad was having fun, you know, but I was having a great well, time. Know it. So, yeah. So you had a job as young as nine and, and a pretty decent one. I think uh, we'd all jump on that right about now if that were offered. Uh, yeah, I know. It's been downhill ever since. I'm well aware. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they didn't tell us about FICA. Yeah. <laughs> so from there, so what was your perspective at that age? So you, on one hand, similarly, because I, I, I had a different experience. I, I have a, my family has a business. And because I was an army brat, it was always distant physically. Um, you know, being back in the city, uh, definitely have, have a different relationship, but I'm still catching up. Right. So, but it was just something that was always there. And I remember having a friend going, help me understand why you, I, you never mentioned, I'm like, oh, I, I, I didn't mention it because it's just always is. Right. So for you just kind of growing up, you had a job at nine um, on, on, on Ms. Pac-Man. Oh, I'm sure Ms. Pac-Man wasn't out yet, but on job. Yeah, it, was, it was evil Knievel stunt cycle. <laughs> what? They made it into a, okay. Okay. Of course you were there. So having this as an is. You know, what, how did you grow? How did your perception of this family business maybe mature over time? Um, well, I think I am um, in that neighborhood at that time, the, each block was just filled with small businesses. Right. And, and because like, so the salesmen and they were mostly men um, didn't like to leave the store because they worked on commission. So I was always sent out um, to do their food runs. And so I would go to, you know, the Korean deli or I'd go get dumplings or wherever I would go. And no matter where I went, they'd give me free food because I was Alan Rubin's daughter or Leon's granddaughter. And what's more powerful to a kid than free food, right? So I just felt like the small business owners are the kings of the city. Like I just thought, you know, they're like the most important people in the city. And so even though, you know, I know I, I didn't, I stopped thinking that at some point, but you know, whatever you think as a kid just sort of nestles, you know, deep into you. So um, but I just really sort of always held small business owners in, in high regard in that way. Have you ventured into an entrepreneurial venture yourself? Um, oh, no. I mean, no? I, did I? I don't know. Well, I guess I published my own book. So I guess I, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. I did. Was it ever, um, so what of were there dreams or thoughts that you would be a part of the legacy? No, so because the thing about small businesses aren't doing well, at least not in New York. I mean, the gentrification was such, and eventually took the business under. The gentrification was such that the last 15, 10 years of the business were just horrible. Like there's just you can't, you know, you can't triple your the price of your merchandise, even though the rent triples. So yeah. It was, uh, and I could, it was, it was nothing that interested me, um, just because it seemed untenable, you know, no. so, so um, I like the community based aspect of it. I mean, my dad was very much like a big part of the community. And so I think I sort of retained that community based approach to my work, but mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I didn't want to take over the business. That makes sense. I, I, I understand. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So what brought you to write about it? What made you want to put this story to press? So. Um, I feel like, and again, this was maybe more so in New York than in Madison, but I just feel like there was all these people are doing reports and 
writing think pieces and sort of bemoaning the loss of small businesses, but I didn't really feel like anyone was telling the story. You know, so I wanted to be like, okay, like data aside, like what actually does a neighborhood lose when it loses a business? And so I thought, well, I'm a good storyteller. I understand policy. And I think the story is interesting if I show the, because it, it was my family story, but it's any small business story, you know? And so, so I thought, well, I don't know, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just do it, you know? Oh, I'm off the screen. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, You're doing great. You're doing great. Thank you. What's the ball and the ball keeps rolling. <laughs> so anyway. Um, uh, besides the 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 great reviews that you've gotten for the the text, what have been some of the feedback you've gotten just about what people have learned um, or others other small business families that you captured something? Because it's yeah, you know, that have an insight that a reporter per se isn't necessarily going to have. So, what's been some feedback? Well, that's been really gratifying because at least I mean. My experiences, I mean, I tend to have a lot of self-doubt. So I was like, I don't know, is this any good? Like, who knows, you know, but so like, <laughs> so I, I've heard from just a lot of people I don't know, you know, just sort of going on and on about the book, particularly people who come from small business families. But I do want to tell you my favorite thing. So um, back when my grandfather owned the business, when he was alive in the 50s, when TVs were new, he was one of those stories that you see in the movies where he turned the TV out to the street. Right. So people could watch the baseball games as they walk by. So I had heard about a guy um, who um, lived across, he and his brother lived across the street and they would listen to it on the radio and they'd use their telescope to, um, to, to watch it. Oh, wow. So I had heard about that from him while I was writing it. So I put it in the book. And then when I did a book talk and this guy hadn't read the book yet and he raises his hand and he tells the same story. So it turns out he was the other brother. So it's just like he just randomly was there, and he's like, anyway. So I thought that was I it's the universe that. impressive. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. He was like, you know, eighty or something. And anyway, but are you doing a lot of? Are you still doing a lot of talks related to the title? Um. Well, funnily enough, I just did one this week. Um. But I hadn't. Oh, and I, yeah, yeah. I guess I am. I'm doing a few. Well, good. Yeah. yeah. Good. Well, we'd love to hear some of the pages. Oh, okay. All right, let me see about the light here. Okay, so um, the reason why the title of my book is called We Are Staying is because in 1977, the store was looted during a 25 hour blackout and 2000 stores were, were looted. And so my dad had put up this We Are Staying sign um, the, the day it happened. So this is, what, this is about that. That's because people were just very happy that he put up that sign. So, um, New York City had long been known for its cycles of decay and renewal, but by any measure, 1977 was part of a dramatically um, dramatic cycle. While New York remained a powerful draw for countless people to pursue their dreams and opportunities, it was also an economic freefall. Steep budget cuts were made at terrible human cost, reducing essential city services, such as police, garbage collection, and basic maintenance. Municipal employees fought back with a wildcat garbage strike in 1970s and the police union threatened to pass out fear city flyers to scare tourists away from New York. In parts of the Upper West Side, the city landscape itself felt inhospitable with abandoned buildings, unreliable subway service, and rising crime. It is hard to overstate how out of control life felt to many New Yorkers at the time. They feared that the social order and perhaps the city itself was in irreversible decline. After my dad put the sign up, people came in to thank him. They were relieved that this long-standing business did not see the looting as proof that the neighborhood was too deteriorated to remain. People came in offering my dad flowers and hugs. They said they were considering leaving the neighborhood, but were reassured by Radio Clinic's decision to stay. One longtime customer said, we were thinking of moving, but if you are staying, then we are staying. Another, after hearing the news that the store was staying, said, what would we have done without you in the neighborhood? My dad was amazed. This was the moment that initially got me interested in the book project. Why did my dad decide so definitively to keep the store open? And why did it matter to people outside our family? Radio Clinic was one store in a city with thousands upon thousands of stores and a moderately successful one at that. It didn't provide any type of service people get emotionally attached to, such as a hairstylist who can do wonders with hair. It was not a particularly beautiful place. Yet customers were coming into the store with flowers and happy to the point of tears that it was staying open. In 1977, on the Upper West Side, it felt like it mattered whether one small business remained open or closed its doors. 
For the residents of the Upper West Side, the looting looked a bit like the end of civilization. Hmm. It left many people shaken. They knew that once a community goes far enough downhill, a vicious cycle of disinvestment begins. Every vacant storefront meant a lower commercial tax base, which hurts the schools and general infrastructure. The lower portion of the Upper West Side had experienced a revival in the years before, but that was in true north of 98th Street, where Radio Clinic resided. Middle-class New Yorkers did not want to be left in a dying city, and many had their resources to leave if it seemed the best course of action. Dad was under no illusion about the neighborhood. He knew Radio Clinic shared the block with board up stores, vacant buildings, residential apartments, and established businesses. He didn't keep Radio Clinic open to avoid adding another vacant storefront to the block or with the lofty intention of anchoring the neighborhood. It was far simpler than that. 43 years earlier, his dad, who had run for his life from Russia, put his stake down on this block and slowly built up the business. When grandpa became ill with cancer, he passed the business on to his son. This was the family's business and my dad wasn't budging. Thank you for that. Yeah. Wow. And your language about what a neighborhood loses when it loses a small business, it's um, it's, it's definitely this ecosystem and not just about providing music and bread and groceries, but the conversations and uh, part-time jobs for the kids who just turned 15 and all of those things, all of those things. And I really, I can see how that would definitely, like you said, those things you learn as a kid nestle in you. Yeah. Uh, that would, how would have, that would have you committed to a neighborhood local focus. Yeah. Hmm. So what's next for you? Um, well, um, I was going to start another book, but uh, my brain isn't really turned there. So I'm actually, I do this uh, podcast with Tequila Benton called Inside Stories. Mm -hmm. and so we've, we've actually been doing, um, people have been sending in their COVID-19 stories and we're sort of helping them with their stories and shaping them. So, you know, so we're kind of, I'm kind of busy with the podcast and I'm actually doing a feature for Leah Smith, a local newspaper. And so one of the things that my dad was always really mad about is after the damage in 77, he felt like no one really considered what happens next for small businesses. So I'm considering it and I'm following three businesses um, for a year. I'm just gonna check back in with them just to kind of see, because recovery from that kind of thing isn't a linear process, you know? So it's so funny how, so that's keeping me busy. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, then the days go by, so I don't know. <laughs> so. There's some Netflix binging in there right now. I don't know. <laughs> oh, what are you watching? What are you watching? What are you watching? Um, well, uh, trying to find something to watch with my son. I'm now watching Breaking Bad, which I'm finding pretty bleak, but it's good. Yes. Um, but uh, I, I do like to do a little mental cleanse with the Great British Baking Show. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. anyway. an accident in there to get your soul together. Yeah. Are you watching anything good? What are you watching? Um, I am okay. So I am watching This Is Us. So, oh. so you you know that I all of my emotions are raw. Yeah. Right yeah. Now. So uh, and before that, it was I realized this is not the time to binge Handmaid's Tale. Yeah, no, I, I can't. I can't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was way too much. So uh, did the This Is Us and Little uh, Big Little Lies, um, Pretty Little Fires Everywhere, Ozark. There's a lot of TV out there. A lot of TV out there. A lot of TV. So I usually will get those 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 power Netflix series yeah. and yeah. With those, but I I never really did a lot of net the network TV one because I'd been now spoiled. I don't want to have to wait a week for the next right. show to come right. out. And I and I always just felt like if I miss one, it's a soap opera. So you miss one. Yes, you can jump back in, but social media doesn't help. You just know that you're missing too much. So I don't. Yeah. Even, I yeah. didn't. I didn't commit because I knew I couldn't stick with it. So some of these really popular shows that did that I saw so much and heard so much about, and this is us is just beautifully written. So yeah, has to kick back and and like you said, put a little sugar in my brain. Yeah. Yeah. So I would love to have you come back and talk a little bit more about you, things that you're scribbling on. I'm going to invite our next writer to the screen, but thank you for sharing. Okay. Uh, See ya. Absolutely. So our next writer who's going to join us, put on my eyes. Angie Trudel Vasquez is a poet, writer, performer, and activist, and a third and second generation Mexican-American from Iowa. She earned a BA from Drake University, where she was awarded a Ruth Lilly Fellowship. 
She earned her MFA in creative writing and poetry from the Institute of American Indian Arts. Um, and she is the author of a, po of a poetry chat book, In Light, Always Light. And her poems have appeared in Talos Journal of Poetry, Yellow Medicine Review, Raven Chronicles, The Rumpus, Return of the Gathering, Place of the Waters, and Cutthroat. And Angie is the Poet Laureate of Madison. So this lovely, lovely title of hers, I'm gonna read a quick excerpt from Mark Zimmerman. But in Light, Always Light is at the same time a very corporeal book, rich in the experiences of friends and family, cooking and eating, planting and harvesting, working and playing, and of course, dying. Trudel Vasquez is a careful observer of the transformational moments, both personal and cultural. Hi, Angie. Hey, how are you? Hi, wonderful woman, how are you? I'm doing good. I moved to my kitchen for better Wi-Fi, so hopefully there's no background noise. So oh, no worries, no worries. We're all cozy right in here. So how how are you finding these strange days? Well, you know, I'm always an optimist, like James Baldwin. I'm alive, so I have hope. Um, and I have a big day job and a big role to play as a Madison Poet Laureate. So I feel like. I am an ambassador for poetry, but I'm also an ambassador for hope and positivity and how do we go forward? And I really think we could turn things around, but it's 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 a struggle sometimes, I'll admit. Um, so yeah, some days are good, some days aren't so good, but you know, I uh, I believe in uh, I believe in us. So thank you for that. We need somebody to believe in the us part. <laughs> so when, uh, in the days that are not as great, is it that they're long or is it the isolation or is there, is it something just in the air? Well, I, um, I think the days that are long and hard are the days that I miss my family. Mm -hmm. They're in Chicago, they're in Milwaukee, and they're so close, but they're so far. So that's hard. And not being able to squeeze the, the little ones in the family, that's hard. Mm -hmm. But, you know, everyone's healthy so far in my immediate family. But I got family in Iowa, too, and they never did have the lockdown there. So they're peaking oh. right now. They're peaking right now. Yeah. And so, herd immunity are they? I don't know. I, you know, we're we have a different type of governor in place. So I think in those days, like I have my rituals. You know, I mm -hmm. drink my tea and I do my yoga and I dance and I hug my kitties and I walk in my neighborhood and I've got this great park I go to that I can watch the people just do all sorts of crazy things. Um, it's, a, it's a place that I go, Radar Hill High Stand Park, where I sled once a year. It is the biggest hill, and it is a joy to go down that like lightning speed and I can't see. But I'm watching people, they run up and down, and they do push-ups, and they take their kites and their kids and their dogs. And um, so that's getting me through, to go out in nature. Yeah. Have you, and I'm looking around, you can do the same. Nobody saw you, have you rolled down the hill? I'm wanting to. But I'm telling you, it is rough. It is a big hill. Okay. And, I, and I am not afraid of the grass or getting in nature or anything like that. But if you wanted to come and roll down that hill, it would be a trip. Because every time I fled down that hill, I think, is this the time I'm going to break a leg? You know, oh. and your hair's in front of you and you can't see and you're spinning. Uh, one year I lost my hat. So I was telling the kids, can you get that hat up on the hill? Can you get that hat? It's a joy. It's a real joy, yeah. Now you are big on yoga to the point where you want everyone to do yoga. And I've I've said this before and help, make me understand. Make me understand. Well, I don't know if it's like, I want everyone to do yoga. I want people to find that thing that makes their body hum and sing and feel good and strong. So for me, it's yoga, but it, it changes. Like it used to be dance and now it's yoga. Hmm. I did Nia at Coral Central. Oh. Yeah, for a really long time. And then then I transitioned. So and sometimes it was biking in Milwaukee. I biked okay. every day to the office. So I think you just have to find that physical thing that feeds you, that you get done. You're like, wow, I feel so good in my bones right now. You know, I could do anything. Something to yeah. make your body hum. Okay. Yeah, makes your body hum, makes your body sing, makes you feel all sexy and young. That's, yeah, yeah. yeah. So how are you, one of the things I'm interested, curious, because you'll give advice, especially being uh, ambassador also of positivity, 
that you have an 11 year old in your life who you're helping to keep less anxious, but whatever yeah. you were telling them, I yeah. think I need it too. Well, yeah, I just tell him like, cause he's 11 years old and you know, school's a little bit, you know, heavy for him right now. And I just, I remember to be that, you know, when you want to be that really good student and you struggle and maybe things don't always go well. And now we're all sheltering at home. Um, but I tell him the smartest people in the world are working on a cure. Like just hold on, like the scientists, the doctors, there are people who care about the rest of us and they're working on a cure. So that's where I try and lift him up, you know? It's okay. hard to be 11. Like, I don't know if you remember being 11, but fifth yeah. grade and sixth grade, that's torture. Yeah, you know? I agree. Yeah. And what yeah. I think about of that age is how, I mean, ev that lunchroom is their yeah. world. Yeah. The, the politics and the dynamics and all yeah. the things that we up here know. Yeah. Um, but how, in absolutely how intense it can be. Um, yeah. At any age, but especially at the age, because you're really just, you're breaking out of, everything has been prescribed to you and you're trying to figure out, you're making a few little wing moves on your own mm -hmm. like the hormones and, Oh, and that's when your friends become so important to you. You know, that's, that's kind of when you're pulling away from mom and dad and you're moving towards, but I'm a cool TT, you know, mm -hmm. and I have a sister who works in Milwaukee too. And we're the cool TTs, but you know, I want to, he's the first boy born in the family in like forever. There's three oh. girls. And now him, right? So we didn't know how to work with boys. We didn't know. So you know, interesting. I we have the same family. My um, we've had a male at each okay. generation. So my cousin, you know, I've got mm -hmm. some second cousins that are males, and so the their yeah. their systems are kicking out boys. Yeah. But it was, you know, my cousin. Uh, she had a daughter first, and by the time she was pregnant with her son, who's now in his early 20s. He says, oh, this will be a piece of cake because she was the junior mama of her sisters, right? She says, oh, just yeah. another baby. Yeah. Sasha, it is not just another baby. These, they, if it's a puddle, they have to jump in it. If it's if from here to there, they have to run to it. The yeah. They're just come different. Oh, the best time is going to his birthday parties, Dasha, and like there's 12 boys jumping off some bouncy house or something, and you just should see how they feed themselves, and you know, there's food everywhere. Like, I I, it's different for me, you know, growing up with all girls, you and know, how many, girls were, how many sisters, two sisters. I'm the oldest. Okay. You know, and then, but I'm the oldest of like 30 first cousins too, you know? So. Oh, you are also the first born. First born on both sides. Change many a diaper. Yeah. 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 Do you have a family gathering? Do you all get together? Sure. Um, we haven't done that in Iowa for a while, but for we host Thanksgiving. That's the one holiday I get. And we bring my husband's side of the family and my side of the family. And we all just crowd in and I get to make the turkey. And like, I love family time like that. Right. You know, mm -hmm. making memories and we all have our specialty and um, it's a good time. Yeah, you know, drinks are flowing. We have more pies than anybody needs. It's <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can do think once it's all over, do Thanksgiving in the summer. Just we don't oh, yeah. we have to wait. We shouldn't have to wait. Yeah, so maybe a, a lot to be grateful for, mm -hmm. and a lot to also be constant. You know, to, to stay in contemplation about. You know, you have made comment about this is a time for an incredible opportunity for change, um, and but not just edits, but a transformational right. change, a human evolution, in right. fact. Yes, so we need to evolve. evolve. Let's evolve, right? Mm -hmm. Like when this is over, we're gonna have climate change we're gonna have to deal with. So let's get these skills that we're learning now and let's learn how we can be different. And you know, in my biggest hope of hopes, we would transform our economy and the way we live and the way we commune with nature and we would live in more symbiotically, right? And like, there's no reason why anyone needs to be homeless or anyone needs to be, you know, hurt. Like, I feel like we can transform ourselves, but we're going to have to work on it. And it's going to be generations because we have a lot to overcome. I was listening to Jen talk about the forming of this country and I have no illusions that the constitution wasn't written for any of us, right? Mm -hmm. None of us. Mm -hmm. Just as nice words on paper. But if you go back even farther, this exploitation and this extraction of like many places, it's been going on for eons. Well, how do we change? You know? 
And how do we change something that's ha been happening for eons? Right. I think we recognize it. We call it. We live in our history. We say, this is our history. Let's recognize it. Because I don't know about the history you got, but I learned a lot after my formal education about how the world really works. Really you know? works. Yeah. And how do, and I'm, I, and, and eager to make this, these changes not just feel like wonderful words. You know, and poet to poet, you know, you can paint this picture and it feels, mm -hmm. and, and I'm gonna rally the, uh, had a chance to listen to um, Angela Davis, mm -hmm. Giovanni, and one of the things that Angela, <laughs> Angela, like we're homies. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> what Angela saying? <laughs> uh, at that time, you know, they were certain that the revolution was, was about to happen yeah. and and clearly it hasn't yet but the the but was grateful to be able to work at it and, uh, and approach it with that kind of a fervor the only that's only possible when you think and feel and know that it's about to happen um yeah. but that's still that's an, from the emotional place so yeah. what's going to be that distinction between how we feel what we want um mm -hmm. and making that move towards this evolution well, I like Howard Zinn. He has the saying that you can only see progress if you look 100 years back. So you look 100 years back and you can see we've made progress. Now it goes back and forth, back and forth. But um, I think we start looking at how we eat. I thought we think we start looking at how we use water. You know, when I take my walks, I am the woman out there picking up the litter, Dasha. I'm out there in the streams getting the litter out. And this is to me like... We lead by example. I know we, we we poets, we can create worlds with our words and worlds, right? We could do this, but I think we have to live it. And I think we have to teach, like you're a teacher. You know, I think of all the people you've taught over the years. You've made the world better just by teaching all those people through still water. You know, and I like to think about laying seeds when I do poetry workshops mm -hmm. and talking to young people and even older people. We can all learn. So, yeah. Laying seeds. We just don't give up. That's the thing. We do not, we don't give up. We have much better success if we never give up. And I, know, I love Angela Davis and Nick, Nikki Giovanni, and, and they are very powerful to me. Um, and I, I believe in their work. And what a great example is Angela Davis. When she came to Milwaukee and spoke at Marquette when we could get together way pre-pandemic, uh -huh. there were so many people in that room and it was a love fest. And we're running, hugging each other from Racine and from Madison and Milwaukee. Uh -huh. like, it is not going to be through the differences. It's gonna have to be through love that we evolve. Yeah. One thing that's interesting and you know, that phrase where the personal is, po is political, the political yeah. is personal, and you, and you describe yourself as a political person. Mm -hmm. And in modern, in this day and age, it could simply mean that you work on a campaign or you only, you vote a party line or really limited to the conversation, the, the transaction, yeah. as it turns out to be of voting or not. Yeah. Um, but when you say that it's part, that it's in, it's part of your being, I wonder, and not at all changing your language, but in my ear, po political, is that is that the description? Hmm, I think so. Well, I live with I live with my husband who's a Marxist, and, and truth be told, I'm an anarchist, right? Mm -hmm. But I know that we have to work inside and outside of structures, right? So I think growing up in Iowa early on in a very white community, about 98% white, I learned, yeah, I learned that I needed to listen to myself and not listen to others' expectations of who I was or because of where I was raised or who my family was. Okay. So that real strong sense of self came really early. And I remember, and this may sound a little bragging, but being one of the smarter people in the class, mm -hmm. right? And just seeing how class and race and economics affected people. So I could be a woman of color but my cousin, because my parents had a little money and some education, I was treated better than my poor white colleagues. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So these are early, early experiences. And I remember being so angry at injustice, even as a young person. So this is just maybe who I am. And as Mexicans in a small white area, we bonded together. So my early days of marching with Cesar Chavez in the lettuce boycott and establishing the Chicano house and you know, going to political rallies or to raising money for AIDS in the when I was a baby activist, like these things, 
This is who I've always been. And I remember when the ERA didn't go through in high school and I was so upset. I'm like, why aren't we in the streets? Why aren't we burning our bras? So, you know, <laughs> it's just the way I approach things. And I'm really lucky to have had politics for breakfast with my parents. Like we would talk about wow. Vietnam. I for breakfast with my parents. We did, we would have long debates. My mom at that time was uh, a Democrat and in the union. And my dad at that time was a registered Republican. And we'd have these great debates. And I did start life as a registered Republican because my dad took me to vote or took me to get my thing. I found the evidence, you know, and I'm really more of an independent, but you know, this is how we were raised. And my husband would be like, how can you guys talk for four hours? I'm like, because that's what we do. We eat breakfast. And then we just sit there and we debate. And I have some political family members too, who went to Vietnam. Or I had a, a white grandpa who was in World War II in Korea. Mm -hmm. so, you know, those these are just things that we've always talked about. Or my mom's dad would correct her education in Newton, Iowa, about how, you know, Mexico was stolen from the United States. So this is just this is just part of who we are. And what a gift in the, that it was, these long conversations with truly different vantage points and not um, and not the choir, you know, yeah. the choir trading. Oh, that's really rich because just often, you know, you you breed yeah. like breeds like um, mm -hmm. and to be able to hold your own, but also maybe not have your mind change, but to appreciate other points of view. Yeah. The debate yeah. and not and not necessarily just about wanting to win. Yeah. And we had some good debates. We'd be like, oh, why can't you just agree with daddy? And she's like, because this is what I think, you know? Just <laughs> the way you taught me. Right. And what so, does life look like now? You know, what so many ways. What can that political, for anyone, uh, yeah. being political, that political life, um, yeah. again, divorced from voting or not? Because I'm right. hearing more activism than it is about voting. Sure. Well, and voting is important, right? People mm -hmm. died for that but that's once a year, maybe twice a year. Um, but every single day, it's every choice you make, right? It's me buying a smaller home so that I can have a smaller ecological footprint. It's when I buy things, how does this impact other people? You know, it's do I put chemicals on my lawn or I did, do I let the dandelions come through? You know, am I, I'm worried about the waterways, I'm worried about the fish, I'm worried about our air. So I'll buy that Prius and that this is privilege, right? I can choose these things. Hmm. And that's really, that's a huge amount of privilege. But I think it's a mindset too. It's not, I wish we didn't think about some jobs being higher or lower than others, right? I wish we thought like all work is valuable. You know, like my grandmother's cleaned houses. They did laundry, right? And that's valuable work. That's important. The work that our, um, our folks do for garbage, like where would we be if we didn't have that? Where would we be without the cashiers? Where would we be without these folks that do these jobs that may not be valued monetarily, but are definitely part of our society and our culture? There's this great book by Marge Piercy, Women on the Edge of Time. Everyone has to switch jobs. So sometimes you're doing maintenance. And sometimes you're working in the waste treatment plant. And sometimes you're watching the children. But I love that book because it, it's kind of a feminist utopian society of how can we imagine work. And then if you're doing like the hard, nasty job, uh -huh. you get to work four hours. Whereas if you're doing a cushy job, you got to work longer. But everyone rotates. And I, I love that idea. Kind of like summer camp. Yeah. <laughs> now it's your time to clean the latrines. Yes. <laughs> what do you think will be uh, the conversation? Ugh. And, the, the, and I'm, I'm drawing on your your positivity. I'm going to draw right now on your positivity. What's going to be the new discussion about work and workers and value of essential uh, tasks mm -hmm. after all of these, after we move into whatever the next phase of normal is going to be? Yeah, I think our next phase of normal will be us in masks for a couple of years. Um, it's going to be interesting. Like my husband's an essential worker, so he's out every day. I'm an essential worker because my day job is in domestic violence and sexual assault. So that's what I do for a day. Um, I think we're going to have to reimagine how we work. Imagination is the greater active and is what one of my mentors said, mm -hmm. Joan Neviat Kane. And I love that. Imagination is the greater activism. So we have, we can create a better world, but it's going to take a lot of us. So I don't know, like I was listening to all these webinars on how to reopen an office 
And it's, it's, it's loaded with possible lawsuits and how do you balance the needs of workers and ASHA. It's just this whole new world. Hmm. What, what back to work. example of a, of a slippery slope? What's you that? Can you, can you give an example of a slippery slope? You oh, think yeah. oh yeah, oh okay. yeah. So we had the safer at home order overturned, right? Mm. And then we had folks in bars last night drinking no masks. All of those folks who own those establishments, if someone contracts COVID and goes there, that's a lawsuit, an opportunity for a lawsuit. So all these people that are opening have to have good CDC guidelines, right? The six feet apart. So it's gonna be interesting as we figure out how we work in this new world. I'm hopeful there'll be a vaccine, but I don't know when, but until then we have a responsibility to everyone to be safe, you know? Do you think some uh, the essential workers like your, you know, you, your husband, the folks that are doing the groceries, now that they, that they've been put in harm's way yeah. for our safety, right. and hopefully at baseline that fifteen dollars an hour doesn't become an argument anymore. But right. sometimes I'm just wondering, do you think that this is a launching space where it will be an equalizer? Because you can argue, oh, you needed us for two months. So now you're not, remember how much you needed us, the whole country? We <laughs> Is that happening right now? I need to know that, that, movement, that, that they're having those Zoom meetings right now. You know, I'm not a fan of capitalism. I don't think it serves any of us well. I'm just not, you know, like, I feel like we do need a balance of socialism. We were all crying for socialism. We need Medicare. We need medicine. We need vaccines. You know, we need homes. We, we need food. We need shelter. We need people not to be kicked out of their homes and their apartments, you know? So um, it'll be interesting because some folks who decry it are the very people who need that right now. And I wanna keep space for them because I know maybe they didn't get the best kind of education. Maybe they weren't loved well enough, but there is enough for all of us that we're gonna have to share and we're gonna have to reimagine. So I'm a fan of sharing and imagining. Most yes. definitely. Um, before I have you share some of your pieces, if you can tell the good folks, um, how do you explain Poet Laureate? What does that mean? Okay, well, from one Poet Laureate to another, which is so glad we like doing this at the same time. Wow. I consider us ambassadors of poetry, right? Yeah. How do you bring poetry to the masses? And I'm very fortunate to be on the Wisconsin Poet Laureate Commission. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted someone who could go into the rural areas and go into the urban areas and talk to the people and make poetry this live thing, this real thing, this bread and butter thing, this wine and water thing, because it is so important. Arts feed us. Where would we be without our music? and our poets and our stories and our movies, because we're all binging on Netflix right now. Right. Where would we be without these words? Right, without, without Questlove doing his DJ mix every night, without Jill Scott and Erica Badu, six million people to heaven, without your poems, the, the, heart, mean, the heart and the human. Can you imagine where we'd be without Motown? Where would we be without all this history that was made by real people like us artists, you know? So yeah, I love, I love the arts. You know, I can't wait to get into a museum again. I can't wait to go listen to music. Can't wait to get my dance on again in a big crowd. Of people, <laughs> you know, My sisters and I, we go to the dead show and that is the trippiest thing ever. That is a wild oh, show. Uh, the Grateful Dead shows. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's a very, that's a very tender age right now. They can't be out together. It's, you know, it's. <laughs> well, Julia, can you please share some, some pieces yeah. from your book? So family is so important to me, Dasha. So important. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I timed it. It's a four minute poem. Okay. It's called, it's, and I love nature and flowers. It's called Peony Springs. So this is Peony Springs, Newton, Iowa from my first book here, or it's my first third collection, but my first self, not self-published, Peony Spring, Newton, Iowa, circa 1986. One, white wood house on a large lot, vegetable garden out back, chicken coops, beehives lined pink, cream, peony plants, coral shrubs scattered the green, divided by a dead man's hands, 50 years. His flower heads droop with perfume and ants in spring. Herbaceous oasis blooms crimson up from the street. 
Two, cousins sneak a cold one from the ice box. We cruise past the dining room table, wall of flesh, the burn pit and raspberry bushes, through the ravine to the seam, the V peak of the hills where dappled light spills between rocks and discarded beer cans. Three, we sit, share sips and secrets, doors on the land, who we want to kiss, vortex to the spirit where the long dead and buried come out to prop us up, sit on the stairs, hold our hands, pat a sad back. We feel them. Our stories unfold at the kitchen table. We listen to lore told by uncles and aunts. People who die come back. Married to place, they leak downstairs, shake their heads and sniff the beers, say yes, yes, fight back. Four, backyard bowls fashion other worlds for us kinfolks, an emptiness where consciousness reigns. To see ancestors ghosts, look twice over your shoulder. See caves of bones, hides worn, hand-shaped tools, hidden dreams awake asleep while walking or on a hill in lotus position, breathing wind transmissions, pollen, cotton seeds, fresh turned earth, blue jay wings, ripe nectarines. Five, trace fingers, outline words in the cool clear stream, frogs croak, Robins dip to drink, a raccoon halts, sees us, pads soft into the gushing creek, washes paws and face with back mitts, bounces off with a nod. We children of poor whites and migrants say nothing, woods and wild animals common. We walk back, hours have passed, and still our people talk a steady stream. Between the doors, 50 bodies, little ones in diapers, dogs with sloppy tongues, calico cats clean on the stairs. Line at the bathroom, three cousins deep, television screen buried behind a sea of legs and blue jeans. Thank you. Thank you. I cannot call her name in this moment, um, but uh, she was also a laureate uh, for the state of New York a few years ago. And I listened to an interview and she gave, she was talking about when she tells her students an exercise of just making a note of all the tiny details, the sound of the garbage can lid closing, the, mm -hmm. the push, the way you have to wiggle at the handle to get the screen door open and, and just paying attention in those details. And I love that piece because it captures those pieces that paint a picture, yeah. um, that also tell a story. And that line of people that, that are gone will return. Yeah. Uh, people who pass into another yeah. realm, they yeah. show up in newborn babies and oh, yeah. memories. And then there's also the uncle that disappears and shows up again. So in both ways, they go yeah. and come back. So thank yeah. you for sharing that work. Thank you for having me, Dasha. It is a pleasure. I'm so happy for both of us in these positions right now in this time. The the world. Yeah. 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 They've, they've, they've got a uh, two uh, poet helians on, uh, on, uh, <laughs> in Dolby stereo here. <laughs> the screen also. So the three of us, uh, I'm fortunate to know both of you and I appreciate that there is this theme of being attentive to home, your mm -hmm. actual home, um, being attentive to home in terms of where you are, even though heart may be New York for you, Jen, you know, you, you are caring and nurturing where you are planted. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, this yeah. is either, incredible times and it's global and it's millions of folks. And really at the end of the day, this is all we got. Yeah. This is all you're responsible for. Um, and just kind of looking each other in the eye, we can all get there. So I, I pulled that from these conversations and definitely from not just your written words, but um, the words that you speak, it's, gen it's genuine how you walk through this world. So thank you. Thank you both. Well, I just, I just want to say that, um, you know, I think anyone who's had a chance to work with you, Dasha, knows how great you are at building community, like, in person. And so it's just impressive to see how quickly you've ramped up to try and build community virtually and online. So thank you for, I'm sure it was a lot of work to learn all this. Um, so thank you for doing that. Thank you. Yes, it was. <laughs> um, but it was one of those things where, like you said, you, you just beat not so much to be a model, but you do what you figure you know. And this is what I know. Yeah. Um, 
And sometimes I wish I knew other things, but we cannot deny how we're made. And it's a huge honor for me to, to be a part of so many histories and to know that um, I've done good stuff so we can keep doing good stuff together. So I appreciate your, your confidence in me. So I don't, I don't take it for granted or lightly at all. So I appreciate your words. Thank you much. And so for everyone else as well, this will be alive on the internet and we're going to uh, definitely make sure that we do everything that we can uh, to get your words and your work out. And I know we're going to see each other again soon. So here again, my digital hug. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you for giving me this time tonight. And I know that I know, like you said, Jen, the COVID mind makes it a little bit difficult to be focused. But writing is what we do; stories are what we tell. And I'm looking forward to seeing more great words from you both soon. Okay, thank thanks. You. Else have a great night, and we'll see you again next time. Okay. Right. Bye.